Good afternoon from the East Coast of the United States. I am Dr. Michelle Fanesteel, and this is Salt Cured Pig Office Hours. And we're almost at the top of the hour. And as promised, we're having um, office hours on So You Want to Start a Meats Business? So let's um, give everybody a minute to tune in, and we will um, uh, get ourselves going. Uh, so... Give folks a, a minute to get here. Glad you could all join us. Um, and we're going to start uh, really soon. It's been a um, crazy day with weather here. We didn't actually get much snow here in Portland. I'm up in Yarmouth, but close enough. Uh, whereas it sounds like everybody got slammed down there in the mid-Atlantic states. And, and north of us, they still they had uh, like delayed school openings and everything so it's been a little a little crazy with the weather there <laughs> um, so i'm glad everybody uh is joining us and i think we'll uh we'll get going it's the top of the hour so good afternoon i'm dr michelle fanesteel and i am the food safety admin here at the salt cured pig but i also run my own consulting company called dirigo food safety and I help people start businesses and get through USDA grants of inspection and things like that. And um, I am coming to you for office hours this week. You know, normally we talk about hazards and HACCP and production and all that sort of stuff. But I had some, um, I had some uh, questions, and I get a lot of questions. I do a lot of entrepreneurship work around uh, like start actually starting a meats business after my last office hours. And I, of course, in my consulting work, I, I talk with people about this all the time because they come to me and because that's my job. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. So I did a poll and um, you can see behind me on the, uh, on the graph paper of what we're going to talk about. And uh, the top three requests were USDA production, what we do about space and facilities. So I'm gonna be talking about what are the requirements for USDA production. These are by and large the same requirements as they have for uh, uh, state production. Um, state production tends to be, there are only, I think, 23 states that have um, state licensed wholesale production for in-state, things like that. So we can talk about that uh, within there. And then um, uh, we need to talk about um, startup. <laughs> like how you start a business, where the money comes from after, after you have figured out what you're making and how you make it, what your space and facility is. We're going to be talking about like the, the nuts and bolts of funding a business. So this is a, designed to be a Q&A session. Uh, and there, if you don't know, there's a comment box. And by all means, send me comments. We're going to be talking uh, until we run out of questions. I've had... Um, I've had some questions. I'm going to, um, uh, people have emailed me a couple of questions. And so I might uh, pop back for those, but we're going to, we're going to get going. Okay. So anyway, thanks everybody for joining me again. I am Dr. Michelle Fanensteel and I run Dirigo Food Safety. I'm the food safety admin here at the Salt Cured Pig. So the first thing we're going to talk about USDA production, what does that mean? Well, Here's the deal. If you want to wholesale value-added products, you need to have a USDA grant of inspection if you're going to do it across state lines. Um, this, by and large, includes over the internet. I've talked to a lot of lawyers about this. There's some gray area, but I assure you, if something bad goes wrong and you have meat that's been produced in one state and sold in another state, the USDA will not look kindly on you if you have not done that with USDA stamp of approval. So what do we mean by USDA production? Well, the USDA uh, has a department called the Food Safety Inspection Service, and they are the people who inspect meat. They start their, their, their meats inspections in what we call anti-mortem, all right? So that's at the slaughterhouse. We have a couple of different kinds of slaughter HACCPs, all right? And the HACCP conversation is not today, but I am doing a uh, live office hours tomorrow morning on my business page talking about HACCP and various kinds of HACCP plans and that sort of thing. But at the slaughterhouse, FSIS starts with examining animals before they died. That examination by and large is done by veterinarians. It must be done by veterinarians. 
uh, if it's if there's cattle because of, of uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And then we have, um, if you are going into slaughter production, you must have a humane handling plan. That humane handling plan is all the time the animals are at your facility and they are alive up until when you stun and bleed and, and kill them, right? Because animals die for what we do, which is why we do it with, you know, attention and mindset and heart. And so... That part is inspected. Those are called slaughter HACCP plans. You, we can do red meat slaughter or we can do poultry slaughter. Okay. Once the animal is dead, we go into we go into um, uh, and you break down the you know you kind of break down and eviscerate the carcass. That's all a slaughter HACCP plan. You take the the head off. You take the organs off. If you are planning on doing slaughter as a business, you have to take a look at the economics of what are you going to do with the hide, what are you going to do with the drop. Okay. All of that stuff, not only do you have to figure out where physically it's going to go, you have to, um, you know, we believe in whole carcass utilization here at Jericho Food Safety, um, figure out how you can be profitable on that drop and on that, um, on that hide and the other things that come off uh, of an animal as you prepare a carcass for further fabrication. Incorporate that stuff into your, into your business planning. So that's, so that's slaughter. So slaughter HACCPs, um, head, organs, all of those can be sold. Uh, if you are looking to do animal production, please know that the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is actually um, promulgated by the Food and Drug Administration, there's, you have to now uh, adhere to good manufacturing practices for, um, for, for FDA production. Okay, and what that means is, is that <laughs> you have to do everything for animal food that you were doing for human food. And that's, you know, kind of easy enough. You don't really have to write a separate hazards plan unless you're selling more than two and a half million dollars worth of animal food. And God bless you if you are. Um, so that's getting stuff ready for fabrication. Okay, and that's, that's the HACCP plan. So you, um, and, and you will also need a recall plan and an allergen plan. Okay. Um, then we move into fabrication and creation of raw retail cuts. So those are um, either breaking it down into primals and subprimals or taking it all the way down to retail cuts. Um, that's called a raw intact HACCP plan. Um, and then we do raw non-intact HACCP plans. So that's um, cued meat, anything that's been um, uh, needled or anything, anything like that, it's considered non-intact, especially in beef uh, and grinding and things like that. Okay. And then, so you have to have those HACCP plans and, you know, allergens and good manufacturing practices. And then uh, in value-added production, which is a lot of what we talk about here on the salt-cured pig, because salt-curing is value-added production, you need to have a couple other different kinds of HACCP plans. Not heat-treated, uh, shelf-stable, that's your, you know, fermented and dry-cured stuff. I did office hours on that a couple weeks ago. Uh, there's bacon HACCP plans, which is heat-treated, not fully cooked, not shelf-stable. There's fully cooked, shelf-stable, that's deli meats. Um, uh, secondary inhibitors, which is kind of some other, other kind of stuff. Um, and so those are, kind of, those are basic ones that you're going to do, okay? And so that's, that's, when we talk about going into USDA production, there are only 11 different kinds of HACCP plans that you can do, okay? And that's, those are, those, are your, those are your options. And you have to plan your production, what you make and how you make it within the context of that, all right? And so in the day-to-day -day aspect of running a business, there are a couple of things that, that, that you need to know. One, there has to be a person who signs off on the paperwork that has HACCP training. Cooperative Extension offers HACCP training. I offer HACCP training online in meat and poultry HACCP, okay? Uh, and you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing. Oftentimes, there's an owner operator involved in this, and we'll go through some of that. We'll go through some of that uh, um, math in just a minute. But what I really want to tell you when you're looking at this, and and we're going to be talking about this word a lot, and the word is profitability. I'm a big believer in sustainable food businesses, but I also believe food businesses are only sustainable if they're profitable. And that means you have to be profitable at every step of the way, okay? I can't tell you how many times I have heard the idea that slaughter is a loss leader. You can't have loss leaders. Every step of the way has to be profitable, and you have to make it profitable, okay? But there's ways to, there's like ways to do the business planning and, and, and ways to, and ways to figure that out. 
So we, um, when we're talking about USDA, this means that, and this is going to get us into our next um, into, into our next topic, there are certain facility requirements around USDA production, okay? And the USDA, if you run a slaughter plant, and if you run multiple species slaughter, uh, you will have a lot of the USDA in your life. That means that you will have an inspector who is physically there. You must account for the time that you are going to have to spend with the inspector, okay? One of the biggest questions that I get when we're doing this work is, how much time, what's the expense? 2% of your annual operating budget should be dedicated towards implementing and maintaining your food safety and quality system. All right, and when you're building, obviously that budget is probably a lot bigger, um, but that's writing the plans, taking the classes, and the time and money associated with those sorts of things. Uh, but 2% of what you are, uh, of, of, of your operating budget. For food safety. So you have to be able to um, house a USDA inspector. You have to have a bathroom under your control. Okay, so that means you can't do this in a strip mall where you don't have a bathroom. The inspector has to have a, and, the, and it doesn't have to be, the, the, we've gotten rid of the rule where the inspector needs its, their own bathroom. Um, and if you're wondering about the origins of that rule, by all means, ping me with a question. But the inspector has to have a lockable filing cabinet and a place to do their work. They're much happier if you give them electricity and internet access, uh, and you'll have a much better relationship with your inspector if you do that, okay? And your inspector is gonna be there looking at your paperwork, and you have to account for the time that you're gonna have to spend with your inspector, okay? Your inspector does their paperwork based off of a system um, called PHIS, the Public Health Information System, and that sends out inspection tasks to them. So we're talking, we're going to talk facilities now. So one of the inspection tasks that your inspector has to do is look at your floors, walls, and ceilings. How often are you cleaning them? Are they actually clean? Are there things that you are not cleaning? What is your cleaning schedule? All that good sort of stuff, okay? The paperwork behind that takes, <laughs> takes, a, lot of, uh, takes a lot of effort. When you are looking at facilities, okay, and this is now we're going to dive into the facilities part of our part of our discussion, but when you are looking at facilities, there's some really key things that you have to look at. The facility can't have holes in the floors, walls, or ceilings, all right, because you have to exclude pests. You have to make sure that mice and rats and flies and cockroaches or whatever are not getting at your food because they all carry disease. They carry lots and lots of diseases. All right, and so if you're going to inspect a facility, look in the drains. Where do the drains go? Ask people for a drain map, okay? I have been in facilities, um, and this happened to be for fisheries, but there was a landlord trying to rent a facility uh, that had a uh, drain that opened directly into the bay, all right? And to them, that was a feature, not a bug, because you could, um, you could squeegee all the soap directly into Casco Bay. Don't rent a facility where you don't know where your wastewater is going because you have to get a letter. Um, you have to get a letter um, that says you have potable water and adequate sewage. Okay, um, so don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the holes, the holes can be corrected. Yes, Larissa, the holes can be corrected, but they have to be corrected appropriately. There is a lot that you can do with, you know, like. Um, what is it, liquid nails and caulking and all that sort of stuff. And if you have holes that you have to fill in, like pipes come into buildings, that's like reality of, you know, getting electricity and plumbing and sewage. Um, and make sure, I see a lot of things where you have the hole, but there are gaps. Well, fill those gaps. You know, you can caulk that. You can, there's spray foam and, and, other, and other things to, to correct that. Uh, however, don't rent a building where you don't know where the plumbing is going. Because they're in a triple net lease, um, which means you are responsible for all of the um, all of the the build out. It's called. Um, you can, I mean, you can buy yourself into a huge problem. And on a, I mean, I have I have seen people get into five year leases where they put a hundred thousand dollars down um, 
to fix the building and then they're kicked out. And then if they want to come back in, their rent doubles. It's insane. I'm going to be doing actually um, just on this, uh, my business lawyer and I, a woman named Jane Friedman in Boston, we're going to be doing a webinar in April uh, around business leases for food production space. So I will let you guys know when that is happening. Uh, Joseph, you had a question. Uh, the 2% for food safety budget inclusive of the charge for federal inspectors. In the United States, if you are doing meat and poultry inspection for what we call amenable species, um, you don't pay for the federal inspector. If you want to do a non-amenable species like rabbit or bison or elk or deer, then you pay for that federal inspection and the charge is $70, $80 an hour and you have to include that. And, and, and I would say that would be over and above that 2%. You get, as an American taxpayer in an American business, you get 40 hours of inspection a week. If you are not doing slaughter, um, your inspector will be there for probably between seven and 10 hours a week because you will be on a circuit and they will go to your facility and they will go to your buddy's facility and they will go to the facility, you know, up the street. This can be, this can, and, and some days you might not even see them. You submit your hours of inspection when you submit for your grant of inspection, okay? And they request that you ask for 40 hours of inspection. One of the things that's hard about small businesses is that the USDA gets paid per carcass. If we are only doing value-added production, the USDA has already been paid for those carcasses um, based on numbers back at the slaughterhouse. And the numbers that we do in local production really don't add anything to the USDA budget, and yet we consume USDA resources. And that's one of the reasons that we can sometimes have contentious relationships. However, they are legally required to offer inspection 40 hours a week during working hours, okay? There are some considerations around that. That means you must do all of your covered activities during working hours. So if you are smoking overnight, Overnight is not during working hours, clearly. You do all your record-keeping activities during the inspection day, okay? And so you come in in the morning and you, make, you read your data logger, okay? That's a covered activity. Reading your data logger, writing down your monitoring for your critical control points. <laughs> Okay, so those um, those covered activities have to be dur during inspection hours, but you are you are um, um, you are granted 40 inspection hours a week. Um, if you go over that, if you're doing inspection hours like way outside the bounds, um, they can try and charge you. Uh, but those sorts of extra hours and things are generally agreed upon beforehand. Okay, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't. Uh, ask again. Okay, so anyway, getting back to getting back to facilities. Um, so no holes. We got to protect against pests. You must have potable water. Okay, so before you enter into a lease, I highly recommend talking to your local lab, talking to your cooperative extension agent, and requesting a water potability test. This will test things like pH. Your pH of your water is incredibly important because the soap and sanitizer that you buy works within certain pH levels. Okay, and you must valid, like you, you, you must show that you're using your soap and sanitation within manufacturer's instructions, and those manufacturer's instructions have a certain pH. You need to know uh, if the water is um, got E. coli in it. Okay, if the water has E. coli in it, that has to be mitigated before you use it for food production space because I assure you the USDA will be testing your food for E. coli. That's part of federal law. Okay. Um, so, and then um, it, they will, generally we also test, um, to kind of depending where you are, um, for some other things, we test for heavy metals. Um, if you are including water in your production, I recommend metals testing, um, just because it's, it's, it's better to, to know that kind of stuff. Um, and it can also have an effect on your cleaners and sanitizers. So, uh, water potability testing before you enter into the lease, okay? Also, if you are leasing, I would make sure that you can get 
a water letter and a sewer letter. So this is part of your USDA grant of inspection where you um, submit this package to the USDA where they ask you about your facility and you give them a map of your facility and you talk about what activities you're going to be doing. And that, um, that will also include a water and a sewer letter where the, your water authority and your sewer authority say that the amount of water that you're demanding can be met by your water supply and the amount of sewage you are discharging is within limits for whatever sewage system that you have. This does not mean that you can't do this on a septic tank. I you started many a USDA plant on a septic tank on a farm. You just have to have the water handling capacity to do it, which can be challenging if you're actually doing slaughter and not just value added production. The other thing that I recommend doing when you're looking at a facility and considering a facility, you have to understand how much light is there. No, we don't measure, what is it, like candle foots or something like that. Um, but you have to have adequate light to the task because the last thing you want is shadows and a bandsaw. Okay, we like to go home from work with all the fingers we started the day with. Shadows and so, so lighting, okay. Um, your facility can't present a hazard to the food, okay? So if you're walking into, if you're looking at a facility and it has been in food production use before and you're walking, you've got a walk-in or whatever, you have to make sure that the walk-in doesn't have like huge gouges in the wall because that's where bacteria can live, one, all right, and two, it presents a physical hazard to the food because pieces of metal fall off into food and, you know, you really can't have that. And so, um, you got to look at floors, walls, and ceilings, okay? If you have FRP board, which is great, it's cleanable, it's, you know, you got to have cleanable surfaces on your floors, walls, and ceilings, basically. Um, your ceiling, your, your, your walls and your FRP board, make sure that there's coving uh, and, and there's a cleanable surface where your... Um, where your, your floor meets your wall, okay? The other thing to consider, and we had this conversation over on the niche meat processors list serve, uh, is about fire suppression. If you, FRP board is extremely flammable. If you're using a lot of FRP board, make sure you have adequate fire suppression. Um, and uh, Jake, in answer to your question, metal detectors are not required. Uh, I recommend, and I, okay, I hate metal detectors. I think they're a terrible CCP and I don't think they work very well. If you look, there's this, just this huge Johnsonville um, uh, recall and it was for hard plastic. I'm sure every single one of those sausages went through a metal detector and they're having a recall anyway of like hundreds of thousands of pounds. So no, metal detectors are not, um, uh, are not required. If, when you go through the, uh, the online HACCP course with me, we can talk about, uh, if anybody does, um, we can talk about metal detection as a critical control point. You can certainly do it, but it is, um, unless your customers are requiring it, I highly rec I, I, I don't recommend them. They're expensive and a pain in the neck to maintain, um, and they manage by exception, which is not great. The better thing to do is to understand your facility and do really good preventative maintenance whereby you make sure your facility is not falling into your food. So you have to understand your facility, basically. Um, facilities, facilities maintenance, if you are um, doing a railing system in a slaughterhouse or even in value-added production, you have to have a way to clean those rails. If you are buying rails, if you are buying um, rails that have been used in other value-added production, um, I would make sure you can take those apart you can clean them and get all the rust off because the last thing you want is a recall because of rail dust on your carcasses. If you are going into a lease, I would also recommend you get in touch with your local lab, and I can help you do this, and you swab. Swab the drains for listeria, especially if you are going into value-added production. Don't lease a place where you don't understand the background noise of the environment and the, and the microbes present. And one of the most hazardous things we can have in value-added production is listeria, and listeria lives in drains, and it lives in the crud that is in the um, in the pan of the compressor, and the gradu that's like, you know, when you go into the walk-in and you can see like this, the, the drips down the, the back of the, the compressor, that's where the listeria lives. Listeria loves rust. If you see epic amounts of rust in a facility, that's not the facility for you. 
okay, because the USDA will ping you on it. So get that stuff taken care of, and I would, you know, recommend that you get the landlord to take care of that. This is one of, I mean, like, I'm God's honest truth. This is why I came out with the locker is because it's really, really hard to find food production facilities. They are out there, but you got to consider how much money you're going to be spending on it and if you can take that, um, that build out with you. Okay, so other, uh, other thoughts about facilities, your bathrooms. Okay, um, if your sink in your bathroom or your hand washing sinks are really far away from your um, hot water heater, I would very much consider getting inline hot water heaters. They're, you know, kind of depending on capacity between $800 and $1,200. And your, um, because your uh, sinks must get to 110 degrees really fairly rapidly. You also have to have soap available and you have to have paper towels and you have to have a covered trash dispenser. All trash that's not in use must be covered. Um, you have to have backflow prevention on your sewage. You have to have backflow prevention, backflow preventers on your hoses and your hose guns and things like that. And that's because, um, uh, <laughs> bacteria can walk up the hoses. That's we don't leave, why we don't leave hoses on the floor um, is because um, listeria and shigatoxin E. coli actually walk. It's really fairly creepy. Um, so those are your, those are your um, facilities for your personnel. Your facilities for your personnel should also include break rooms, separate places to store personal food and beverage. The USDA gets very upset when they find your ham sandwich in with the um, raw products because one gross um, and two that's against good manufacturing practices okay your facilities when we talk about facilities it's incredibly important before you go looking at facilities that you describe to yourself on a piece of paper you know thinking is it's it's your time but it's some of the most valuable time you can spend what do you make and how do you make it and what are your supplies? You know, you'll notice I talk about this in every office hours that I do. But if you know all of that going, going in, you will know whether or not the flow works in your facility because in the, or in the facility that you're looking at. Because when we're looking at facilities, it's really important in food that we have the raw materials, which is kind of dirtiest if you want to, if you want to consider it that way, but the least prepped stuff coming at one end all right, and going through and getting more and more controlled for pathogens, controlled for chemicals or whatever, um, and cleaner, all right, and more suitable for human consumption, okay, and then the people, they come in and they are as clean as they can be where the food is as clean as it can be. And so generally we talk about food going in one direction people and clean air going in the other direction so that the dirtiest people, the dirtiest air is in the lowest risk part of the facilities. Okay. Look at your facility layout in that term, in those terms, because if you are doing ready to eat production, you absolutely have to segregate your ready to eat production from your raw production because you can't have cross contamination. If you're using allergens, so any of the big eight allergens, dairy, eggs, wheat, soy, tree nuts, peanuts, shellfish, scalefish, okay, you must ensure you don't have allergenic cross-contamination. And your facilities are a huge part of that, okay? You have to have dry storage, and your dry storage has to be, you know, like clean and dry. You don't have to clean it every day, obviously, but you have to have a place to store the cardboard boxes, the labels, the, you know, all these different sorts of things that you need to like package your food, your spices. A lot of people have um, a whole, um, like a spice room um, and they clean the spice room because they bring things in or, you know, um, and they separate out their spice room a lot of times for like allergen production because, you know, that's, their are um, allergens. You can get a lot of allergens in with spice mixes and things like that. Um, and so that's why you have to know what you're making and how you're making it. Um, you have to know how your supplies are going to be delivered. I have a lot of conversations with people about um, if your supplies are coming in and they're on a truck, whether or not there's a truck lift or whether or not you have to buy uh, some sort of, you know, like a, um, a pallet jack or a, uh, a, a palleting forklift 
that kind of thing. You have to budget for those. <laughs> like you need to know when you say, okay, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get a, a, a boxes of primals. I'm going to get carcasses. I'm going to do, where is all of that stuff going to go? And as you're looking at facilities, you have to have a picture of that in your mind's eye or else you're going to rent the facility and you're going to be like, oh, I didn't think of that. Okay. Um, so other things, um, other things with facilities, it's really important that you can um, house chemicals away from your food. You can't, you can't have um, like your chemicals out where your food production is going. That's in violation of, you know, good manufacturing practices and chemical hygiene planning. And it's, you know, you trip over chemicals and it's kind of a bad idea. And so you need a place away from food and food production um, where you can store your chemicals. You will always, always, always run into problems with your floors and your storage. I have been doing this for a long time and everybody has problems with floors and storage, okay? You are never gonna have enough storage in your head, okay? Like I tell you, you know, like if you do production through lean manufacturing, um, you can, reduce the storage issues, you know, and, and inventory issues. Inventory is incredibly expensive. Um, but, um, and then if you are doing meat production, you are putting pressure and water on floors and pressure and water destroys floors. Okay. Your cleaning and sanitizing chemicals um, need to be selected in a way that you maintain your floors. If you are putting epoxy down on your floors, understand what you are getting into, okay? It is hugely expensive to epoxy a floor, and I have talked to many more than one. Um, production, uh, you know, production manager or owner or whatever, where the, um, they put down an epoxy floor and two weeks later, they are, it is delaminating and they can just pick it up in sheets. It's terrible. Um, not all epoxy floors are like that, clearly, and there are some production where that's really called for, but before you go spending a lot of money on epoxying your floor, see what you can do about smoothing out concrete, polishing your concrete, um, and using appropriate sanitation on that. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the stuff around facilities that I often that I often run into. So bathrooming facilities, officing, um, and um, and then various you know stuff. You know, three base sinks. You got to have places to wash and dry things. Um, everything has to have hot water. If you are decontaminating carcasses with 180 degree water, please make sure that water is 180 degrees when it hits the carcass, not when it leaves the hose nozzle. Um, and you have to, you have to account for that with inline hot water heaters. That's the only way to do it. Um, okay. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a minute. Um, we're at the bottom of the hour and then we're going to get in, we're going to get into what probably a lot of people are here for, which is money, um, and how we raise money and how we go about money. Uh, for doing this. So any other questions on the USDA grant of inspection process? So again, we have a USDA grant of inspection process and it um, uh, is you submit your HACCP plans and your recall plans and your allergen plans and your facility plans and they give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Your facility has a whole bunch of things that we've talked about. Um, many of which are out of your control if you are leasing and so don't back yourself into a terrible lease. Um, and I'll give it another minute for other questions on facilities and then we will jump right into um, funding <laughs> and how you get money to do this. Okay, great. All right, so uh, it doesn't look like too many other questions are coming through on facilities, but if you have them, I'll, I'll address them. All right, so next thing I wanna talk to you about is, um, uh, okay, Joseph, uh, in Ready to Eat Meats, how much time and money should be budgeted for validation? Once you get your grant of inspection, you will go into what's called 90-day validation. You will have a USDA stamp for doing that, okay? Um, and so your 90-day um, validation, we do a lot of stuff in the first two weeks and make sure everything's working correctly. You will go a lot slower. And so I would say at a minimum, um, you need, 10 to 12 hours of somebody really looking at the food safety plan each week for the first two weeks. And then as you, it, and then it backs off 
uh, it backs off through that 90 days. So in terms of a full-time equivalent, it's a quarter of a full-time equivalent at a minimum in that first, uh, I, would, I would say in that first two weeks. And then it backs off and I, I think, um, kind of depending on what you're on, on what you're doing and what your volume is, but in, in lower volume stuff, um, by the end of the, um, by the end of your 90 day validation, I would say people are spending about an hour a day going over checklists and, and, and doing verification. So you've left sort of your validation part of your life and you're kind of into verifying, am I, am I doing what I said I would do on an everydayness? Um, and we probably spend like an hour, um, an hour most days and then another two hours spread out over the course of the week. Um, on doing verification. So there's a lot more when you begin um, and then a lot less as you, um, as you go, you know, kind of through the, kind of through the process. And so in terms of budgeting, in terms of budgeting for that, I would think of it in full-time equivalents. And, and if you have a production manager, um, they're in a full, and they're, you know, one full-time equivalent, I would say throughout the course of the 90 day validation, um, between a quarter and a half of their time is going to be spent on the food safety plan itself, getting samples, to, you know, doing um, uh, parts per million testing on your on your sanitation chemicals and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the actual food safety, you know, like taking care of stuff um, after the 90 day validation probably backs off to between, I, I don't know, 15 to 20 percent of the time in, in verifying documentation and things like that. So, but that's a really good, that's a really good point. And I'm going to come back to the labor issue as we go through, as you can see behind me, I've tried to take some notes <laughs> um, and, and talk about it. So what I, what I want to talk about is money considerations. So I, you know, I'm going to state my bias here. I run a for-profit business. This business is how I feed my family. And I believe in sustainable food. And I believe that sustainable food is sustainable through profitability. So if, um, you are not encouraged by the profit motive. Um, take what you have learned from this office hours and um, go about your daily business. But we're going to talk about the profit motive here. Okay. Um, so hobbies cost money and businesses make money. And if you are going into a business, that business is there to make money. Okay. The best book I have read that lays all of this out, okay, is called Profit First. And I will put a link in the live, in the notes when we do this, when I, um, when I, when the video posts. But it's, it's called the Profit First Mentality. And I am going to go through this um, behind me, okay, and I hope this works on the, <laughs> on the, um, on the video. But this is how this works, all right? And we're going to start here. Because in order for people to lend you money or give you a grant, you have to show them you have a viable business. And in America, we show you have a viable business by showing you make profit. And what that means is, is we take profit first. Okay, I do this in my business and it may, I, I can't even begin to tell you the difference it's made in my business. So um, in meets production, we have what's called top line revenue. And it's called top line revenue for a reason because it's the top number in your profit loss statement. Uh, if you are not already running accounting software, I absolutely recommend getting QuickBooks or FreshBooks or Zero or whatever um, and making that investment up front in accounting software. I did not. It was incredibly painful last year to make that move. So we have top line revenue. We get our top line revenue, okay, from our cut yields or however many pounds are going out the door is finished product. So cut yield in this is pounds out the door in finished product times how many dollars per pound? That's your top line revenue. How many pounds do you sell and how much money do you get per pound for it? That will give you a top line revenue number. All right. We then subtract our materials cost. And in this case, that's our, our hanging weight or uh, however however it is that you pay for animals, okay? Um, your hanging weight times your dollar per pound, all right? That's your materials cost. It is not exactly cost of goods sold. This is, I'm gonna, this, um, this accounting methodology is like prior to your bookkeeper getting their hands on your books, 
okay, and prior to uh, your account. All right, but all of this, you know, is is, is uh, leads into good accounting um, good accounting principles. Okay, not to be confused with the other kinds of gap we have in food. Um, okay, but we subtract out from our top line revenue how much it costs for us to buy our raw meat materials, and that by and large is the hanging weight for what we were talking about, or that's the price for the primals or whatever. Okay, times the dollar per pound. All right, and that is going to give you what. I term your real revenue number, all right? You can't make this real revenue without buying that meat in. It's not, we're running meats businesses, right? Okay, that is 100% of your total budget for your business, okay? And then, um, zoom in on the equations. Yes, I will totally do this. I'm going to do it at the end so I don't give make everybody car sick. Um, and I'll take my camera and zoom and zoom in on this. Okay. But we're going to have, um, so real revenue. So that's top line revenue minus meat expenses. Okay. And then that real revenue gives us a profit. All right. We take that profit first and we take it out of that real revenue. The recommendation is 5% where you know you have profit, okay? Then from that real revenue number, we do owner's compensation, okay? And owner's compensation should be between 30 and 40%, okay? Because you have to pay yourself to do this, all right? Not only do you get to make a profit in your business, you pay yourself for doing your business, all right? And then guess what? We're going to make money. So that means we're going to take out taxes. All right. I know we don't like paying taxes, but April 15th is coming up and I just paid all my business taxes. Okay. Um, if you are paying taxes, that means you are making money. All right. And I know we all say, Hey, I broke even this year. I didn't owe anything in taxes. Well, you're going to give 15 cents away to the government. Um, and you're going to make 85 cents. <laughs> okay. Rather than giving nothing to the government, but also making nothing. Um, so we don't aim for break-even businesses by and large. All right, that, so that's taxes. All right, and then after all of that, you have operating expenses. So once you take out, you have your real revenue, that's 100%. You take out your profit, 5, 10%, all right? None of this 2 and 3% profit margin because nobody's going to buy your business at a 2 and 3% profit margin. And you go into business with an exit strategy. Who is buying your business? Build your business so that one, you love running it and it's, it, you know, you get enjoyment out of running your business. Is it, you know, you know, sunshine and daisies every day? Absolutely not. But you should generally enjoy running your business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's a whole mindset thing, but then we can talk about that. But um, you got to build your business with an exit strategy in mind. I do due diligence for investment companies on food companies. Okay. If there's no profit, um, we don't offer very high prices for companies. I'm not lying. Okay. If there is bad HACCP planning, if you have had, if you're not keeping track of what you are doing um, and how you are doing it and you don't have good SOPs and good manufacturing practices, um, I just count your business by about 60% because I know I'm going to have to go in and do all of that for the investor. So keep that in mind when you're building a business and don't shortcut yourself on your, uh, on, on your business processes, your HACCP planning, your employee planning, your accounting systems, all of that matters when you are going to turn around and sell this business. Okay. And so profit, profit matters in that. Okay. You're getting, you're getting this, you're not doing this for the rest of your life. I mean, how many people are cutting down carcasses and they're, and they're 60 years old and their back hurts? Well, dude, they want to sell those businesses by, you know, and if you're going to go in and you're going to buy a business, do this analysis for the business and find out if they really are making a profit before you invest your money. Okay. So profit, five to 10% profit is real business. Okay. Owner's compensation. It's not a sustainable business if you're working in it and you're not paying yourself a living wage to be in it. A living wage here in Maine is $17.50 an hour. That's about $35,000 a year. If you are killing yourself in your business, you want to make well more than $35,000 a year. And in the modeling that I do with people, we have them making over $100,000 a year on a three-day cut week. 
Okay, so you're processing three days a week and you're working in the business the other two days a week doing marketing and selling and distribution, all those other things. Okay, pay yourself accordingly. Taxes, we've really sort of already talked about, um, and then operating expenses. So operating expenses have to meet that number once you have taken out your profit, your owner's compensation, and your taxes. And those operating expenses, labor. Okay, start with small enough volumes so that you can do the work yourself. And this is, this gets you a couple of different things. One, you will really understand your business. If you are the chief cook and bottle washer, and it is you that is, that is opening up shop at six o'clock in the morning for pre-op sanitation, cutting down the meat, vacuum packing everything, is it a gigantic pain in the butt? Absolutely, but you know what? You're not gonna be able to appreciate how to do it and how to make your systems so that you can teach somebody else to do it, okay? Labor is a huge, huge, huge cost, and you have to make sure that in your operating expenses, you account for labor. Account for your own labor first, okay? And make sure that it's not that it's not overrunning with your owner's compensation because the marketing, the, um, you know, the, <laughs> the filing of the taxes, all the things that you have to do as the owner, you have to be compensated for that as an owner. But there's also compensation that has to come out of you as labor. Um, workers' compensation insurance. In the production of food and food manufacturing, especially in slaughter, workers' compensation insurance is really fairly crazy. All right, and you really need to know and you need to call your, um, you know, they're, they're, I mean, call your local um, chamber of commerce and ask for a business insurance agent and they'll connect you with one and get a really good idea about your insurance costs. You know, for the work that I do, I also carry really incredibly expensive insurance. It's called errors and omissions insurance, okay? Um, and that is not, anywhere near as expensive as insurance as if you run a slaughterhouse, okay? Um, and so understand those insurance costs. Once you have all of this stuff squared away, then you can start your business planning, okay? And when we do business planning, I recommend people do the following, okay? We have a one-year business plan, all right? One-year business plan, all right? And in your one-year business plan, I think that you should be able to break even. I think you should be able to create a $100,000 business and break even. Will it feel like money in the bank? Absolutely, okay? But if at year one we say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, everything I invest in my business, I'm going to get out, okay? And it's going to be a break-even year. Yes, I know I talked about profit and owner's compensation. It's okay in year one that we just have a break-even year, okay? So in year one, we're going to break even, all right? And we talk about this because you're going to have higher labor costs generally in year one because you have to teach people how to do it. People are going to quit because this is hard work and you're going to have to fill in for them and all that good sort of stuff. All right. Um, so in year one, we break even. All right. And then we get to year two. All right. And we should be experiencing lots and lots and lots of growth. Okay. Because up here in this owner's compensation, you are paying yourself to do sales and marketing. All right, and we start at small enough quantities that we don't have like gargantuan amount to sell and we're not sitting on inventory, all right? So in, um, in year two, we are looking for like 15 to 20% growth, all right? And then we get to, and then you have your numbers for, for that kind of growth. And then I highly recommend you look at five years and 10 years. We overestimate what we can do in the near term and we underestimate what we can do in the far term. So in the 10-year plan, sit down and ask yourself, what do I want to be doing in 10 years? All right, create a number associated with that. My 10-year plan for my business, now granted it's not a, a, a a uh, food production business, but there's no reason you can't do this because I work with a lot of businesses at that this size, but my 10 year plan is a $10 million business. Okay. There's no reason your 10 million, your, your 10 year plan can't also be a $10 million business. 
And we throw around those really big numbers. And yeah, maybe you need to start at a hundred thousand dollar business and move yourself up to a million dollar business. But if you want to take your amazing local food and get it into the hands of restaurateurs, into the hands of, of people in your communities, into the hands, into regional distribution and things like that. I, I, work, I work at plenty of $10 million businesses that have, you know, 20-ish employees maybe, okay, and they are distributing nationally. And they have, and the difference is, is that their profitability comes from the CEO mindset. Okay, and the CEO has trained his or her mind to do the things that need to be done to make the profit that they need to make. Okay, and so when we're talking, whether we're talking $100,000 up here, a million dollars, $10 million, $100 million, the difference is the mindset. And the people who are, who are making the money, who are sitting down and doing the things that they need to do to get it done. And if you want to sell this business, okay, you have to create a profitable business. And it is way easier to sell a profitable million dollar business than it is to sell a break even $300,000 business. A break even $300,000 business is a gargantuan amount of work. And it's, and it's, um, I see those folks, I mean, I work with a lot of them um, because I tend to work with entrepreneurs who are at an inflection point and they need, you know, like more auditing so that they can, they can sell to more people and things like that. We got to improve their food safety planning. But a $300,000 business that is breaking even, in my observation, is more work than a profitable million dollar business. So build the profit in, okay? Take this model of profitability, all right, where you look at labor costs and workers' compensation and you build a reasonable amount of growth in. So we break even in the first year, we grow by 15% in the next year, and then you, um, you build that growth out till you're at your, you know, five and 10 year mark. All right, and that's how you build your business plan. So your business planning, okay, is not, I have to do this. Your business planning is, this is my plan to secure my demand chain. Who's gonna buy my stuff, okay? And there's, that is marketing and sales, my friend. And I can, if you, know, if you guys want, I can, um, I'm a, a certified coach in a system called Book Yourself Solid, and I can talk to you about how we create and market to the people we are meant to serve. Okay, that's, that's a whole different office hours. But securing that demand chain, that's what gets you that profitability. But securing that demand chain means showing up. It means it's, you don't secure your demand chain by cutting meat and by curing the world's most perfect culatello and tying the world's most perfect culatello. I mean, believe me, I think it's beautiful when you all post your pictures. But your profit comes from your ability to show up to go to that trade show, to send the email to that person, to meet with that, meet with that restaurateur, to, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the everydayness of the showing up that drives profitability. Okay. I've had a business for a long time. I've been, you know, working with businesses for a long time. When you show up, okay. And when you do the things and you do the work, that's what drives profitability. Now, there are things that happen. I'm not going to lie. On my locker, my raw materials are maybe doubling. We don't quite know yet. I'm doing the work to figure out how to, cre how to create the same product uh, with different raw materials um, at the same price point because that's, I mean, that's what my business is, right? That's what, that's what you do when, when things change. And you have to be able to adjust for that. I highly recommend having a $10,000 kitty, okay, of money that you don't touch except in dire cases of emergency, all right? When you are getting money, it is incredibly easy, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, it's not easy, but it's incredibly easy to fund construction, okay? Banks love construction because it's tangible, it's shiny, it's pretty. They can walk there, they can walk in the door, okay? Banks will fund construction in ways they will not fund operating expenses, 
All right. And so that's why we talk about leasing. That's, you know, because it's, you know, doing a build out, you can't do a build out in local food for under a million dollars. And I, you might not even be able to do it with that. I mean, I'm working with a local slaughterhouse. They are at $8 million for their budget. Okay. Um, but I have worked with other places that have done hundred thousand dollar build outs. And when we talk about break even, you got to include the cost of your, you know, like your lease and all that sort of stuff, or the cost of your mortgage on your land, um, in this, in this operating expense, because when you go for financing or you go to the USDA for a grant, or you go to the small business, um, the SBA, um, Small Business Administration, or the FSA, which is another branch of the USDA, for a grant, they are going to ask you, how the heck are you going to pay for everything? Okay, and you know you're going to pay for everything because by doing it by doing it this way, you will have taken profit, you will be paying yourself, you will be saving for taxes, and then you're going to take all your other expenses, and they're all going to meet this line called the operating expenses. And that's real business planning, okay? The rest of it is how you show up, your marketing plan, okay? That is the stuff that you give away for free so that you can sell the product that you're making. Sometimes you give away your time, you know? I mean, I, I know a lot of people who are offering um, cutting classes because that... <laughs> Frankly, I think it shows how difficult it is to do meat and then you, and then they're in the business of just selling it to you so that your customers don't have to do it yourself. I mean, that's a, that's why I teach food safety, you know? Um, so there, you're, you're, you have marketing, okay? And marketing by and large is a math problem. You are going to have conversion rates. You're going to need to talk to, I don't know, 10 or 15 chefs to get one to convert and buy from you. All right, you have to understand what those numbers are. And you can't understand them until you are out there and doing it and having those conversations. All right. So when you're building your business plan, you're going to run into three kinds of problems. Okay. You're going to run into math problems. All right. You are at some point going to have a math problem where you're going to say, oh my God, my operating expense is, and, and what I have to like pay for everything is not large enough. Then that is a question is, is your business at the correct scale? Do you have to sell more? Do you have to sell it for a higher price? Do you have to buy it for a lower price? All right. And I mean, that's why we have Excel spreadsheets, folks. All right. Um, those are math problems. Okay. How many, how many chefs do I have to get in front of in order to sell a lot of, uh, of, of prosciutto? Okay. That's a math problem. You will have technical problems. Those technical problems are things like, um, how do I design my website? I want to sell over the internet. I, how do I actually do that? What, you know, how do I set up, what is it, Shopify? Um, how do I get onto Amazon? How do I, you know, like those problems, those are technical problems, okay? Um, how do I write my asset plan? That's a technical problem. That's not a math problem, all right? Um, by and large, you can hire out your technical problems. There are lots of different ways to hire out your technical problems. And you just got to figure out which ones you're going to hire out and which ones you're going to keep in. Okay. And sometimes that then turns into a math problem. But in my case, it's much cheaper for me to hire a bookkeeper, okay, to help me create my profit and loss statement that then gets sent off to my accountant. Um, than it is for me to try and do all of that work in QuickBooks myself. Okay, I do some of it, and I hire out some of it, and that's a math, that, that takes a technical problem and creates a math problem out of it. All right, math problems are solvable. The third problem, and this is the one that trips the most people up, and it trips me up, and I work on this all the time, is the drama problem. Okay, and it's when we have conversations in our head. Okay, so to take the previous example that we were, we were looking at, you're selling to chefs, okay? And it takes, you, you need to have 15 conversations to get one conversion. And you don't know how to find those chefs, okay? And you're convinced that you can't find those chefs. And if you do find those chefs, you don't know how to go and approach them. That's a drama problem. 
Okay, that is you and your self-doubt and the conversations, you know, as we, as we say in American Sign Language, this is your monkey mind, okay, um, talking you out of doing it, all right? And you have to be able to distinguish your drama problems from your technical problems from your math problems, okay? And by sitting down and doing this profit first model and looking at your numbers and saying, yeah, you know what, I am worth 40% compensation, every single money conversation you have ever had will come into your head, okay? And if you're going to make this business a reality, you have to deal with that head trash. We all have head trash. I have head trash. We have, everybody has head trash, okay? And the leadership that the local food businesses need to create sustainable regional food economies and vibrant rural economies requires that we as leaders in the industry understand the difference between our technical problems, government food regulations and meeting them, our math problems, workers' compensation insurance and, and, and paying that bill, okay, from our head trash problems, which is nobody likes me. I'm not going to be able to do it. The USDA is out to get me, okay. There's all this head trash that I, that I hear. And, and the thing is, is that it's okay, okay. It's okay to have head trash and work on recognizing it and overcoming it and doing the work anyway. And that's the secret. Like, that, that, that's as simple as it is, is that you recognize your math problems, your technical problems, and your drama problems. We make our drama problems as small as they can be, we deal with our technical problems, and then the math becomes really fairly simple. And then we take that math and we go to the bank. We go to friends, family, and fools. Those are the first three groups that you use to um, fund your business. Friends, family, and fools, okay? And we have fundable businesses because we've done the work we understand the technical part, we understand the math part, and we've reduced the drama to an acceptable level and we keep trying to reduce the drama, though it'll never go away. You know, 50% of, of the time, it's really hard being an entrepreneur, and 50% of the time, it's great. <laughs> okay, and so that's our presentation on So You Want to Start a Meats Business, and we started with USDA production and grants of inspection. We did, we talked about space and facilities and that good sort of stuff, and then we talked about business planning. My favorite business planning tool is AgPlan through the University of Minnesota. They are free. I will post the link, but if you Google AgPlan University of Minnesota, it's there. Um, there is money available. The money in food generally comes with higher interest rates than most of us want to pay, but it's, that's, that's the reality. Food is a risky business because a lot of people don't go into it with a profit mindset. Okay, and so that's the presentation. That's office hours for today. Um, you guys have had great questions. I will stick around for some more questions uh, if you have them. We will, of course, be um, posting this on the Salt Cured Pig. Um, I will download it and create a shareable version if you guys want to share it with your business partners who weren't able to take this. I will, and of course, I'll be taking questions um, on the on the Facebook page and things like that. So I'll give you all a minute for. Uh, more questions if there's anything that I didn't um, that I didn't address uh, or you'd like me to address uh, I'd be happy to um, and oh and Larissa as you requested I'm gonna do my best to not knock everything off and I am going to there you go oh god I'm gonna make everybody sick but that is that's the shoot sorry guys my hands shake um, I have what's called an intention tremor, which is why I don't do surgery. So USDA production, space and facilities, um, revenue, cut yield, okay, times your dollar per pound. Then we subtract out materials expenses. That's your hanging weight in dollars per pound. And that gets you your real revenue, which is 100% of the money that you have to do something with. Then we take out profit. We take out owner's compensation. We take out taxes. And that leaves us with operating expenses. Your biggest operating expense is going to be your labor. In your first year, we look to break even. In your second year, we look to make 15%. 
and then from year out and year out from that, grow your business, okay? So there we go. Um, those percentages, um, we're talking about 10% profit, okay, 40% owner's comp, 10% in taxes, and 40% in operational expenses. 2% of those operational expenses is, absolutely, is running your food safety system, okay? And by the way, if you defer on your preventive maintenance and you don't take your preventive maintenance out of that operational expense, I assure you it's going to be a lot more expensive. I was in a production facility that, I kid you not, had 20 years of deferred maintenance, and um, I'm not sure what we're going to do with that facility. So don't get into that situation. All right, and remember, we begin as we mean to continue, and you begin with an exit strategy in mind. Profitable businesses sell. You're not going to do this for the rest of your life. Do it this way, and you will have a profitable business to sell. All right, I'm going to see if I can do this here. <laughs> All right, I am Dr. Michelle Fannin-Steele. I'm with Durago Food Safety. It's been my pleasure to do this Salt Cured Pig office hours. We will see you on the page. Everybody have a great day. Thanks so much for tuning in.